Tonight I'll be speaking about rate and rhythm control for atrial fibrillation. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to highlight the advantages and disadvantages of a rate control versus rhythm control strategy for atrial fibrillation. I'll review options for control of ventricular rate in patients with atrial fibrillation, as well as options for rhythm control. By way of an overview, I will uh, have some overlap with what Dr. Goldhaber's already covered, but I think some repetition is good. The prevalence of atrial fibrillation increases with age in both men and women. Atrial fibrillation is a growing problem in the United States and worldwide. By 2020, an estimated 3.3 million patients will be affected with this disease. I'd like to review some definitions. Lone atrial fibrillation is used to describe atrial fibrillation in the absence of structural heart disease. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is when episodes terminate spontaneously between 24 hours and 7 days. Persistent atrial fibrillation fails to self-terminate within 7 days. And then finally, permanent atrial fibrillation lasts more than a year and a cardioversion attempt has either failed or not been made. Atrial fibrillation has some major consequences. First, there can be loss of organized atrial contraction, which can manifest itself as exercise intolerance and heart failure. Patients may also experience uh, the sequelae of rapid ventricular rate, which could be exercise intolerance, heart failure, myocardial ischemia, and cardiomyopathy. And this may present as chest pain. And then one of the most dreaded complications of atrial fibrillation is left atrial thrombus. Uh, that places patients at risk for systemic embolization, including stroke. And uh, we will hear a lot more about stroke prevention uh, in the next few lectures. The rationale for rate control is to avoid the hemodynamic instability that's associated with a fast ventricular rate. In doing so, it's hoped that we will be able to alleviate symptoms of palpitations, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, and chest pain and hopefully prevent complications of heart failure and tachycardia-related cardiomyopathy. The rationale for rhythm control is much the same. It's to avoid the hemodynamic instability associated with a rapid ventricular rate, but also to alleviate symptoms that remain despite adequate rate control. It's also to further improve exercise capacity and quality of life and then prevent complications of heart failure and tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy. So now I'm going to go through the interesting debate between rate control versus rhythm control. Prior to the publication of large randomized controlled trials, most clinicians preferred rhythm control. It was felt that restoration and maintenance of sinus rhythm, or the normal rhythm of the heart, was believed to be the most effective means to control atrial fibrillation symptoms. But each of the strategies have their own strengths and limitations. Rate control does improve rate-related symptoms and is effective for reducing hemodynamic instability due to a rapid ventricular response. Unfortunately, Many patients may remain symptomatic despite adequate rate control, and rate control itself does not reduce the risk of thromboembolism. On the other hand, rhythm control has its own strengths and weaknesses. If sinus rhythm can be maintained, it's expected that quality of life is improved. Rhythm control is effective for improving rate and rhythm-related symptoms. However, again, many patients continue to experience episodes of atrial fibrillation, so-called breakthrough episodes. Antiarrhythmic drugs are associated with toxicities. Some of the most important ones are proarrhythmic toxicities. And again, like rate control, rhythm control does not reduce the risk of thromboembolism by itself. And we will talk a little bit more about that. So now I'd like to talk about some of the randomized control trials that have compared rate control with rhythm control. And the first of those is the AFFIRM trial. 
So in this figure, we see um, all-cause mortality in patients who were assigned to rhythm control versus rate control. And what we can see is that cumulative all-cause mortality trended towards being increased in patients assigned to rhythm control compared with rate control. When subgroups, when the total cohort of patients were divided, was divided up into subgroups, the vast majority of subgroups seemed to do better with rate control than rhythm control, or at least had a trend towards doing better with rate control um, with regards to all-cause mortality. In the RACE trial, a composite endpoint was used to tease out whether rate control was better than rhythm control or vice versa. This composite endpoint consisted of death from cardiovascular causes, heart failure, thromboembolic complications including stroke, bleeding, and requirement of a pacemaker to be implanted. And this composite endpoint showed a trend towards being more frequent in patients assigned to the rhythm control arm. And importantly, Severe adverse drug events related to the medications used were significantly increased in patients assigned to the rhythm control group. When we look at event-free survival, event-free survival was poorer in patients, or trended towards being poorer in patients assigned to the rhythm control group. Other trials have looked at rhythm control versus rate control. In the PF trial, diltiazem, which is a calcium channel blocker, was compared with amiodarone, which is an antiarrhythmic drug. And what they found, that they found there was no difference in quality of life. But interestingly, patients assigned to the amiodarone group, the rhythm control group, had more frequent need for hospitalization than patients assigned to the rate control group. In the staff trial, a strategy of electrical cardioversion with a rhythm control agent was compared with rate control. And once again, there was no difference in quality of life, but patients assigned to the cardioversion and rhythm control group had more frequent need for hospitalization. In the HOT CAFE trial, Sometimes in cardiology, we have very funny names. In the HOT CAFE trial, um, rate control was compared with rhythm control. And there was a trend towards increased mortality and thromboembolism in patients assigned to the rhythm control group. So based on all these trials, it doesn't appear that rhythm control is any better than rate control and may indeed actually be worse in certain patients. We used to think that a population of patients, heart failure patients, would do much better if they were maintained in normal sinus rhythm and out of atrial fibrillation. But in this large randomized controlled trial, we can see no significant difference in mortality in patients assigned to rate control compared with those assigned to rhythm control. Interestingly, we learned some very important lessons about anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation from these two trials that had nothing to do really with anticoagulation, had more to do with testing rate control versus rhythm control. In the rhythm control groups of Affirm and RACE, anticoagulation could be stopped if sinus rhythm had been maintained for at least a month with antiarrhythmic therapy. In contrast, the rate control group had to continue anticoagulation as mandated by the protocol. When we look at endpoints of stroke and systemic embolism, we see a trend towards an increase in number of strokes and systemic emboli, or number of strokes um, in patients assigned to the rhythm control group compared with those in the rate control group. Also, the rate of stroke and systemic embolism are relatively high in both groups. When we look at endpoints in the RACE trial, we see thromboembolic complications that include stroke. And we see in the rhythm control group, there's a trend towards an increased number of thromboembolic events when compared to the rate control group. So what we've learned from these studies is a rhythm control strategy does not obviate the need for anticoagulation. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about rate control as a strategy itself. So rate control is preferred in patients that have atrial fibrillation that has lasted longer than one year, 
Patients that have increased left atrial dimension, these patients are thought to have such an enlarged left atrium with such disordered electrical activity that a rhythm control agent is unlikely to work. Other candidates for rate control include patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. You remembered I defined that as patients who have very uh, transient but recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation. These patients tend to come in and out of atrial fibrillation and do not respond as well to rhythm control therapy. Also, patients with underlying medical causes of atrial fibrillation that haven't been treated yet tend not to respond well to rhythm control. And finally, patients with sinus or atrioventricular node dysfunction tend to have rhythm problems when started on antiarrhythmic therapy, mostly bradycardia. Beta blockers are one class of rate control agent that are recommended for patients with atrial fibrillation. Most of the beta blockers appear to have similar efficacy. In general, it's important to make sure that the beta blockers are dosed at a frequency that prevents breakthrough episodes of atrial fibrillation, breakthrough episodes of tachycardia. Beta blockers are preferred in patients who have left ventricular systolic dysfunction or heart failure. Calcium channel blockers are another group of agents that are recommended for patients with atrial fibrillation for rate control. They may be preferred over beta blockers in certain groups of patients, especially those with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma, because beta blockers can sometimes cause bronchospasm. Calcium channel blockers should be used in, with caution in patients with left ventricular dysfunction, as some of the calcium channel blockers can decrease myocardial contractility. Digoxin is another agent that's commonly used in rate control. It's recommended for rate control in patients who have atrial fibrillation and left ventricular dysfunction. It can be added to beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. And it's generally felt that digoxin works by reducing the ventricular rate through increasing vagal tone to the atrioventricular node. And therefore, it's felt that it's not helpful in states of high adrenergic tone. And what we notice clinically is that patients on digoxin will note that their rate control is not as good when they're exerting themselves or when they're under stress. If pursuing a strategy for rate control, there are certain goals that one should strive for. Uh, some of these goals include a resting heart rate of less than or equal to 80 beats per minute, a 24-hour heart monitor average of less than or equal to 100 beats per minute, and no heart rate, th heart rate that's greater than 110% of an age-predicted maximum, a heart rate of less than 110 beats per minute with moderate exercise. These are the goals to strive for. Now I'll speak a little bit about rhythm control. Rhythm control is preferred in patients who have persistent symptoms despite rate control. Patients who, have in, who are unable to maintain adequate rate control. Rhythm control is often favored in patients who have a first episode of atrial fibrillation. Patients that are very young and very elderly and then patients who have symptoms of heart failure or left ventricular dysfunction. But the reason that these are in yellow is that these two groups can sometimes be controversial when pursuing a rhythm control strategy. Rhythm control is frequently used in conjunction with an attempt at electrical cardioversion. The use of an antiarrhythmic agent before and after cardioversion is thought to increase the likelihood of successful cardioversion reduce the energy requirement for cardioversion, decrease the rate of early return of atrial fibrillation or ERAF after cardioversion, and then help maintain sinus rhythm after a successful cardioversion. These were some interesting data from one of the largest ever assembled uh, registries of cardioversion patients. In general, cardio cardioversion is thought to be a very benign procedure. Uh, one of the interesting things from this study was that the rate of systemic embolism and stroke was higher than previously thought at a rate of five to six uh, patients per thousand. Pill in the pocket is a particular strategy of using rhythm control that you may have heard of. A pill in the pocket approach allows patients to self-administer an oral dose of an antiarrhythmic agent when symptoms of atrial fibrillation recur. Propafenone and flecainine have been the most rigorously evaluated for this strategy. Uh, 
Patients considered for a pill-in-the-pocket approach should be maintained on a rate control agent and should have no evidence of structural heart disease or conduction system abnormalities, mainly because the most commonly used agents are thought to be contraindicated in patients who have structural heart disease or conduction system abnormalities. A pill-in-the-pocket approach reduces emergency room visits by half and reduces the length of atrial fibrillation episodes to six hours or less. In addition, the rate of adverse drug events is actually quite low. I'd like to talk a little bit about dronetarone, which is a new agent that has come out on the market for atrial fibrillation. This drug is very similar in its antiarrhythmic effects to amiodarone, which is a drug that uh, many of you may be more familiar with. Dronetarone has some structural differences that are believed to reduce the frequency of long-term complications that are associated with amiodarone. Uh, one thing about dronetarone is it should be avoided in patients with decompensated or New York Heart Association class 4 heart failure. Both amiodarone and dronetarone are designer molecules, and some of these designer changes actually lead to more, um, imp to improved tolerance of the drug. So these two iodine moieties have been removed from amiodarone in the transition to dronetarone. These iodine moieties in amiodarone are, supposed, are suspected to mediate some of the thyroid toxic effects of the drug. The addition of this methyl sulfonamide group is thought to decrease the fat solubility of dronetarone and in doing so reduce the incidence of neurotoxic effects. In the Athena trial, dronetarone was compared with placebo for patients with paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. The investigators found a significant reduction in hospitalization or death from any cause in patients assigned to the dronetarone group. Also, death from cardiovascular causes and first hospitalization due to a cardiovascular event were both significantly reduced in patients assigned to the dronetarone group. 2011 uh, newly released guidelines for management of atrial fibrillation really encourage clinicians to take into account comorbid cardiovascular conditions uh, when considering a rhythm control agent. So conditions like hypertension, coronary disease, and heart failure should all be taken into account when trying to pick the right rhythm control agent. And as Dr. Goldhaber talked about, dabigatran has been newly added to the recommendations as a class one agent for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. So to go over an overall, a very general approach to rate and rhythm control, the first step and the foundation of treatment for patients with atrial fibrillation is to make sure that precipitants are treated. So if the patient has heart failure or an exacerbation of lung disease or thyroid disease, it's important to treat those first because the other therapies of rate control, rhythm control, and even advanced therapies may be less effective until the precipitant is treated. Anticoagulation is an important step for stroke prevention in appropriate patients who are at risk for stroke. In general, most patients start with a rhythm control strategy. If the patients are still symptomatic, sorry, a rate control strategy, if the patients are still symptomatic after a rate control, then rhythm control agent can be added. For the subset of patients who fail both rate control and rhythm control and are symptomatic, advanced therapies can be pursued, and Dr. Estes will be speaking about that in, after the break. So in summary, based on data from large randomized controlled trials, the majority of atrial fibrillation patients should begin with a rate control strategy. A rhythm control strategy can be considered in patients who fail rate control, in a subset of elderly patients, patients with heart failure, and those presenting with an initial episode of atrial fibrillation. Regardless of whether rhythm control is selected, anticoagulation re remains one of the most important components of therapy for atrial fibrillation. <laughs>